Welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, invasive species that have the potential to impact our industry here. Um, we wouldn't be able to have this program today without the uh, generous sponsorship of uh, Matt Stevenson Smith in Agrifage. So um, please make sure you thank him during the break, um, during lunchtime. Um, it's all uh, made possible from, from their group. So appreciate that. All right, so um, let's move forward. All right, so uh, invasive species. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the framework of how we monitor things. So obviously, um, our agriculture is highly regulated. Um, we have a, a safe from a food safety perspective. Um, regulations of plant trade protects our farms and our natural resources. Um, when an invasive species in, is introduced, we don't really know how devastating it is. It's always hard to estimate some of these things, um, depending on where it's actually introduced and, and some of the factors around it. Um, and therefore, this economic effect of invasive species is often difficult to estimate for those that might come in and even quantify for those that do arrive. <laughs> um, so risk uh, assessments are done by all of us, um, scouts, growers, entomologists, pathologists, um, we're all team working together to be able to do um, pest risk analysis. Risk analysis. So um, some legal framework for you to understand and kind of have a context of this is uh, plant health rules and guidelines are actually legal matters. Um, the World Trade Organization settles these plant health disputes. Um, and there's a particular agreement, sanitary and photosanitary agreement um, the specific, specifically has the purpose of harmonizing sanitary and phytosanitary measures on a um, wide basis as possible. And so um, there's, I think, 180 different countries that uh, agree to this, um, these regulations, so that we can be on the same page with it and protect one another. So these health regulations, if we think about it from the international, national, and local level, um, they get more restrictive as they're more local. On the international level, they're kind of just broad spectrum um, to give us some guidelines and framework to work under. Um, so why is risk analysis important? Um, first is because that helps us to facilitate trade and protect our resources. Um, it's always a balance of policy and science, right? So there's science that goes into these risk analyses, um, but then there's other perceptions in um, what then results in the policies that come about. Um, there's the rules themselves. Um, there's uh, a, a response whenever we have something new. So by having this, um, these policies and science in place, we're able to establish rules that make sense to help keep us clean or to uh, manage outbreaks when we have them, and then um, and, and know how to respond when when we get them. Um, it also helps us to identify the different pathways where things might be coming in, so that we can um, monitor those in in particular. And then there's this World Trade uh, Organization assumption that um, it's going to impact all countries the same same way. So hopefully it benefits us all in the same way. Um, it doesn't show favoritism for one or the other. So um, for here in the U.S., uh, we've got the USDA, and part of the USDA is the Annual Plant and Health Inspection Service, and part of that is the Plant Protection and Quarantine Group. Um, so. The mandate of the USDA is to protect and promote US um, agricultural health. And um, that's why they go forward and, and regulate things and, and monitor things. And so um, part of one of the programs that's a, a joint program between federal and state organizations is CAPS. And so this is monitoring that happens so that we can have early detection of pests and diseases um, that are of regulatory concern. Um, so <laughs> then. Um, of course, then we also have a, the state level FDACs, and in particular, their division of plant industry. And they're the ones that are helping to implement the laws, regulations, and programs um, related to our plant, uh, plants and plant pests for the state of Florida. Um, so they're the ones that are doing registrations, inspections, and then identification, monitoring, and eradication of exotic pests and diseases. Um, one thing to note is that um, under Florida statute, um, reporting uh, invasive species is a legal obligation. Um, so it's not something from university or IFAS that we are regulating. It's at the state level, FDACs, and what they're doing. And 
we often obviously want to partner with you to help figure out how do we manage this. Um, and then the state level, they're trying to figure out how do we protect the greater interest, um, larger community. And then there's also um, the National Plant Diagnostic Network that's um, nationwide. That is a group of um, pathologists and decision makers um, that, that work to be able to help establish these protocols that we have. Um, so in Florida, we have at least two new orth orthropods established in Florida every single month, uh, which is kind of worrisome. Um, significant work for the state in Florida, uh, Florida regulatory agency. So for them to be able to monitor this, it's, it's quite a lot and we'll get some examples of how this happens. So uh, why do we have so many invasive species? Uh, we have a whole lot of commercial shipping, plane travel, cars traveling, obviously all our snowbirds that are coming down, all of us in agriculture who go from one state to another, um, trucks bringing produce into Florida, uh, everything that comes with it. Um, here in Florida, we have 14 different um, deep water ports all around the state. Uh, we've got 12 different international airports. So obviously a lot of places for entry for potential um, exotic pests. So um, just to give you an idea in the just Miami, 90% of US cut flowers come through the port of Miami. Um, so that's, and you can think of when you're talking about cut flowers, you're not just talking about, um, you're talking about majority of the, the plants, right? So you have a lot of leaf matter and stuff for pests to be able to hide in. Fruits and vegetables, about 51% um, is coming through uh, the Miami port. And you can see that's compared to some of these other huge cities um, and huge ports that we have in, in the US. Um, <clears throat> here's some, agricultural interdiction stations that we have. Again, trying to stop, um, inspect things and stop spread, prevent spread from coming um, into uh, much of Florida. So does anyone know um, what two pests we have new quarantines this summer? There's two pests that we're currently quarantining for, Cali doesn't count. Medfly. Not medfly. What's that, land snail? Yep, so the giant African land snail is one of them. Anyone know what the other one is? Oriental fruit fly. So the oriental fruit fly was first detected again in uh, May 17th and from other surveys um, was a, a couple more uh, individuals were found. And so there's a quarantine for that. And there's also a quarantine uh, for the gi uh, giant African land snail. And, Giant African land snail just a few months ago was finally declared eradicated from Florida, and then we unfortunately find it again. So um, that's a little bit of what's happening right now on the regulation side. Um, anyone know what this pest is? Great, brown marmite sink bug. Um, so just some an example of how things sometimes work. Um, it's native to East Asia, first detected in 2001 in Pennsylvania. Um, it's since spread to 48 states. Uh, 46 states plus um, California, uh, Canada, I think four provinces in Canada. Um, it has a highly extensive uh, host range, um, limited number of natural predators and effective insecticides, which makes it difficult to, to control. And many of you who grow up the East Coast have dealt with it in the uh, Mid-Atlantic region. Um, and of course it's decreasing marketable yield. So um, here in Florida, here's as of February where it's been detected. Uh, whoops, this didn't get going right. So um, it's a, a prominent hitchhiker pest. So a lot of times when we find it here in Florida, it's because it's coming with someone traveling. So it's not necessarily being established here. Um, because of that, distribution is always changing. It was first found to be established, a local population that's uh, replicating in uh, Lake County, the one highlighted there. Um, the last two years we've done surveying in tomato fields down in this area. We've also seen it on farms in um, Collier in Lee County. And so those were, we're not 100% sure how much they're replicating. It was just a few specimens, um, but it was found multiple times. And then also up in Manatee County as well, some of our team found it there. Um, so that's one example of a pest and how it's spreading. Um, who knows what this is? Anybody? Hopefully we'll by the end of the day. Um, this is the medfly, and the Mediterranean fruit fly um, is one of the most destructive pests worldwide, has more than 300 different hosts, um, a huge range of crops. 
Um, the state and federal agricultural inspectors monitor more than um, 56,000 fruit fly traps, just, not just for this one, also for oriental fruit fly and Caribbean fruit fly, but um, this is happening on a, a statewide basis um, as an early detection network. Um, and they're checked every seven to 21 days, depending on where it's located and the risk because of the ports around it and things like that. But um, this is a, a hugely impactful one. There's even a Mediterranean fruit fly hotline. Um, it's, and the global impact is estimated at $2 billion. So huge economic impact in potential for us. Um, and here's somewhat where it's distributed. This is a little bit old, uh, I guess very old, nine years old. Um, but you can see the red is, is where it's always present. It's been, um, it's not in these green places, at least as of that point. Um, often had been detected sometimes, but this is where constant monitoring is happening in, in those green regions. Uh, in Florida, it's been here many times. I don't know if you've seen this picture before, um, but in the early 1900s, uh, 1930s, and then in the 50s, and then many other times in, in multiple different places. Uh, most recently, it was August 2010 um, in Palm Beach County in the Boca Raton area. Um, and it's estimated that close to $70 million um, has been spent on eradication efforts. Um, and that's not including the actual impact that it had on our agricultural community um, during those times. Uh, um, so it, to kind of give you an idea of why we do that much monitoring, you know, a huge, that billion dollar impact seems huge. Um, but here's an example from um, Dr. Dr. Oscar Liburd. Um, up at UF, he was called to go to the Dominican Republic in 2015. And um, most of you know Dominican Republic is connected to Haiti and there's some mountains there and um, the medfly um, was transported over and you can see in one year um, the impact that it had in exports for them. So just to give you kind of a taste of, of why it's important to understand some of these um, invasive species um, to be able to have some idea of what to potentially be looking for so then we can partner with um, our university as well as um, state level folks for to get um, certain identifications. Um, so we can do that in multiple ways. There's a digital diagnostic um, network that UF has. Um, you can use that, but you can also just call me as an, your extension aid it, you know, to WAD, others here. Um, to, to be able to come in and look in or bring a pest to us. Um, then we also have a, an insect diagnostic lab with uh, Dr. Lyle Buss at UF. Um, Dr. Kerry Harmon is the plant um, diagnostic center um, leader in Gainesville. And so all of these are ways that we can try to make sure we identify these things accurately so we can know how to respond to them, um, the impact of them. So uh, reporting, again, it's a legal obligation to report these. Um, to FDAX, and, and they're often the ones that are helping out identifying um, what these species are. And um, just kind of threw these in here so that if you ever find something, you can always go back to this presentation since it'll be recorded and posted, and you can look up some contact information um, to do that. So that's the end of the introduction. Um, and any questions as our next speaker comes up? All right. So next up is going to be Dr. Jawad Qureshi, and he'll be talking about um, potential threats. Well, we'll kind of go through a, an ID section now and talk about um, insects and, so, and then pathogens after that. First looking at uh, vegetables and then moving to citrus. Uh, thank you, Greg, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, like Greg said, uh, he gave a good uh, overview of the uh, situation and, and why it's important for us to keep monitoring and uh, looking for the pests uh, uh, so that we can identify if there are any new threats and try to deal them early in the timeline. Uh, otherwise, uh, when it is too late, they are established, then uh, we have significant uh, economic consequences. So these, these are the some of the things that, uh, that I said we need to know. Uh, their role and uh, some of the potential impacts, what kind of damage they cause. Uh, and sometimes it's not easy because if it could be a, a lepidopter larva feeding and you are seeing feeding from already established species. So it is not easy to, unless there is some uh, really 
uh, highly significant difference or something to, to see that it's uh, it's something new or not. So there are different ways that you need to do. You either rear the larvae to get the adult stage to get a more accurate idea on the thing or bring that sample to us and, and we can uh, do that uh, for you as well. So it's, it's important because it uh, all ties into the management. Uh, so the basic knowledge of the problem and the proper description uh, allows us for effective identification uh, for the discussions and management. Uh, we can reduce the risks and avoid surprises if, if we find those problems uh, early, reduce damage to the crop, uh, reduce production cost. Definitely whenever we find a new pest and start managing uh, our expense on either biological or chemical control uh, goes up. Uh, either the number of sprays increase. We have seen that situation with several pests. A classic example is the Asian citrus psyllid and psyllid. Uh, uh, we went on to the treadmill of insecticides, sprays with up to 12 or more spray applications uh, per year. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, when a pest gets in and then we look for their uh, biological control agents, it, it is also costly. We need to go into those regions, try to identify those uh, species, bring them, test their host range and get them uh, uh, established in, in the areas. And uh, eventually we don't know if they will get established or not, uh, depending upon the climatic matches. So the intent of this slide is not to turn all of you into entomologists, but just uh, when you are out there, it's always a good idea to have some of these things uh, with you, some a plastic bag, a hand lens, uh, some vials uh, with alcohol and uh, aspirator and some of the suction devices, uh, some brushes, uh, scissors and pencils and labels so that you can label things uh, when you find them. Obviously for a very small insect, you definitely uh, need a hand lens and then and some of these materials uh, to preserve uh, uh, and bring those uh, materials uh, back to yourself, and if you have a facility there to, to examine them or bring to us or FDAX or other places. And if you want to go further uh, with your interest or if you're scouts, uh, you can also use some of uh, 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 these uh, items such as uh, a sweep net, uh, because if, if, if you are looking for some, some larger insects or, or even predators and parasites, some, some smaller ones, uh, you, you usually may not be able to see them visually. So if, 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 if you do the sweep net sampling in, uh, from time to time, uh, you may be able to find some pests that you are not uh, seeing through the uh, visual observation. So I, I will be, uh, talk about uh, uh, some, of, uh, some of the pest threats uh, that we have and uh, uh, basically about uh, some fruit fly species. Uh, some lepidopteran uh, moths, uh, and then uh, a beetle uh, as, as well. And, uh, here uh, you see there are six uh, major genera of uh, fruit flies uh, that are, are concerned. Uh, they belong uh, in different regions, but that doesn't mean that they are specific to that region. They, they have been introduced across regions and, and in different established in different regions. And under each genera, you see uh, there are hundreds of species that are there and with several uh, significant pests uh, in, in each of those uh, as well. So Bacto, uh, Bactocera and Ceratitis are, are the two uh, are important genera and where we have some concerns for some species. So I will share some information on those. So for most of, uh, uh, for these uh, genera, uh, they, they have a specific uh, coloration pattern uh, on their wings, uh, as you can see here uh, uh, for these three genera separately. And then uh, these three genera have a kind of common this pattern. But then again, besides these color patterns, then there are uh, other morphological differences uh, into the, these different structures on the wings uh, that are used to uh, clarify and identify those uh, species. So here, uh, just to give you an example for uh, some of the recognition features for, for the genus uh, Bactrocera, uh, as you see here, uh, a coastal band along the margin of, of, the, of the wing here. And, and then there is an annual streak. I hope you can see it here. Uh, and then uh, there is an inflated cell, uh, which is somewhere here. So 
So these are some of the broad uh, uh, genus level uh, features that, that uh, you, you can use to recognize that which genus they belong. And then there are further complicated identifications or features that the taxonomics used to um, identify them. So like uh, Craig mentioned, uh, uh, oriental fruit fly or, or Bactrocera uh, darsalis is, is one species of, of a concern. Uh, it is native to Asia. It was uh, intercepted in the continental uh, US and, uh, but it's only established uh, in Hawaii. Uh, there are uh, more than 400 types of fruits and vegetables uh, it, uh, it can attack. And some of uh, the one that it commonly uses is cucumber, citrus, and, and tomato. And these are the commodities uh, where we already have uh, enough problems. And they could readily cause the destruction to, to, the, to the crops and, and to lead to the huge economic uh, losses. So that's why uh, the prevention of uh, some of these species is critical and, and the measures that are being implemented. For the serotitis, uh, uh, you see here, uh, it's, it's, some of these characters are very easy to recognize, at least at the genus level. Uh, you see this uh, uh, black reticulation in, in the base of the wing here, uh, and then these three uh, brown areas uh, uh, pointing uh, down like uh, arrowhead. Uh, and, and this is a specific feature uh, of, uh, of this genus uh, that will at least get to you, you to the genus level. So you, you can see those features that, that I mentioned uh, clearly on uh, here on uh, Ceratitis capitata, uh, Mediterranean fruit fly, uh, which is in this genus. And, and that again is a, is a highly significant species which is native to Africa uh, and found across the world established in Hawaii, but not found in the continental US. Uh, Florida, California, and Texas are at high risk. Again, it's another species. Most of these species are highly polyphagous, like I mentioned earlier. So this one also have more than uh, 260 fruits, flowers, and vegetables, and nut posts. Uh, and it prefers uh, fruits with the uh, thin skin. Uh, so that's why detection and, and serving is uh, important. Uh, you cannot get the larvae, uh, so you will have to cut the fruit to get the larvae of these. And again, uh, to get them to some kind of identification, you, you will require uh, to rear those uh, to the adulthood. And uh, the management, uh, there are several different ways. You, you use traps to get them, and also sometimes in the management, then there is citralid fruit fly release uh, programs that are used and uh, spot treatments uh, with different insecticides uh, as well. So the next group uh, of insects is, is the Lepidopterans. Uh, again, these are, uh, it's a large group uh, uh, with, with the several species in, in this group and uh, they're, they're caterpillars. Uh, uh, they have uh, a chewing type of mouth parts and uh, they can cause uh, huge destructions uh, here are some of uh, the examples, uh, hornworms. Uh, they have a horn on, the, uh, on their, their head and, and even a one larva can uh, destroy a, a whole uh, tomato plant. Uh, similarly, the swallowtail, uh, are, uh, they have antenna-like projections, uh, which, which give uh, a kind of smell uh, which is used to uh, uh, keep their uh, predators uh, uh, from uh, from feeding on them. Uh, uh, they basically feed on uh, foliage, uh, 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 the leaves and e the fruits of the plants as well. So here, here you have uh, some examples. Uh, these larvae can, can totally destroy the fruit so they are not marketable anymore. And also they can basically defoliate uh, the plants on which they are feeding. And several of them, they also have uh, a wide range of hosts like, uh, and, and even th there are some weed species that they use. So even when the cultivated crops are not there, they are still surviving in, in some form and shape uh, somewhere. Uh, Tuta absoluta, the tomato leaf miner. Uh, right now it's, it's a huge concern uh, for Florida. And we are uh, later going to see a presentation in the program uh, from Spain on, on this insect and how, how they are dealing with it. Uh, it it's native to South America. Uh, it was uh, detected in Hawaii uh, 
but not in the continental USA uh, and the southern states are uh, at high risk of establishment. Uh, 50 to 100 percent uh, loss can occur uh, from uh, from uh, the attack of this pest and basically scouting and, and pheromone traps are the best way uh, to monitor the populations. Uh, cultural management can help rotation with the uh, non solanaceous crop and uh, destroying the infested plants and uh, definitely removing the plant debris uh, after after the harvest. So we, we already have uh, a, a pest that is uh, uh, more uh, similar uh, to this insect, uh, which is called uh, uh, tomato pinworm, uh, like you can see. So uh, they, they are brown, silvery looking adults about the same size. And uh, there are uh, not very much differences in, in the larval uh, larvae as well. And I will show you example later because the larval identifications are even harder because the larval morphology changes uh, as they develop through uh, different instars. Uh, uh, wild, old wild boarworm, Halicoverpa armedra, is another pest of concern uh, found in Florida, uh, intercepted in 2015, uh, but not established yet. Uh, you can see these uh, four wings with the light beige uh, with the kidney shaped spot uh, near the wings. And these are different features that you will see uh, on, on different moths uh, that I will uh, show you uh, in, in the following presentations. And, and those identifications are early, easy uh, uh, based on, on those patterns and uh, to, to know the species when, when you are looking at those adults. And, and some of them we, we have here, so you will be able to see them, uh, the specimens as well. Uh, we already have corn earworm, uh, which is a somewhat similar pest, but again, uh, uh, you, you can see here uh, the, the coloration and, and, and the intensity of, of the patterns here, uh, which, which makes them different, and, and you can uh, clearly see those uh, differences. Here are some of the other pests of concern uh, that, that we have. Again, you can see uh, the patterns of coloration, so if you are catching, any of, of those moths and, and you see uh, something different, uh, you can bring those uh, for uh, identifications. Uh, it's uh, rice cotton cutworm. It is a wide host range uh, and includes tomato, uh, citrus, uh, sugar cane. Uh, and uh, there are uh, plants and pheromone traps are used uh, for the monitoring of this uh, pest as well. Uh, another uh, tomato fruit borer. Again, you can clearly see uh, the demarcations on the wings of the of the adults, and uh, it's easy to, to identify them. And they are again uh, found throughout the South America, Caribbean, and and Mexico. Uh, and again, serving its uh, keys. Uh, some of the features again, they all have a wide host range, and and cause damage uh, uh, to the fruit. Uh, what a mall and potato moth and, and other pests uh, again uh, spread to Caribbean, South America, and Mexico. Uh, a wide host range, and uh, sorry, in this case, more more preferably on on the tubers uh, uh, in, in the potato. And uh, you can see the example of economic loss here uh, in Costa Rica. False furling moth. Uh, another species uh, native to Africa. It was detected in California, uh, but not detected since then. Uh, again, it's a polyphagous. Uh, uh, citrus cross crop losses could be up to 20 percent uh, and reported from South Africa. Again, monitoring is important for uh, this pest. Like I said before, most of these uh, Lepidopteran larvae, when they cause damage, uh, uh, it's, it's somewhat uh, not easy to differentiate. Uh, maybe this case here, when you have a damage from tomato pinworm, uh, they have these uh, very small holes and they're damaged and don't, won't go very extensive into the fruit uh, compared to the damage by the old world uh, wall worm, uh, which, uh, which can be very extensive uh, in the fruits. Uh, just an example of uh, how the larval uh, coloration and morphology changes as they develop to different instar. For the southern armyworm, an example that we already have uh, here established, and you can see as they emerge 
and and go through different and star and how how they change to uh, different color patterns and and markings on their body as they develop to the adulthood. Hemiptera, uh, Greg talked about it, sting bugs an important group and I will just focus on those. We also have aphids and the millibugs, we are short on time. So that's why I am rushing through some of these slides uh, and I will go to the pest of concern that we have here in this group, uh, which is the Bagrada bug. Uh, it's native to Africa. It was intercepted in Florida, but not established. And most susceptible plants include cabbage, broccoli, cotton, potato, and sorghum. Uh, the feeding can cause damage to dry out and wilt, and culture management is uh, important. Uh, again, uh, some more information uh, on, on the pest. Uh, there are other names, uh, painted bug, uh, painted stink bug, or African stink bug. Uh, some of the hosts uh, that it, it causes damage to. Here you can see more uh, uh, symptoms of uh, it's feeding damage to the to the growing uh, uh, points in the plants, and uh, there's some on figs and uh, damage on collard greens. Uh, it can be uh, similar to harlequin uh, bug here, which is already established. The markings are um, orange markings you can see, but here you can see they are much less uh, in case of Pagrada bug compared to the harlequin bug. It is also similar to some of even the uh, uh, predated species uh, like here in this lady beetle. But again, you can see that these markings are uh, uh, highly, uh, significantly different where you can easily distinguish them. Uh, this uh, beetle species uh, is, is, is the last other one uh, that is of uh, concern. It is native to Africa, uh, have not been detected in the continental uh, US and uh, its distribution in Australia and New Zealand indicates that uh, regions of the US uh, are at risk. It's major pest of grape corn and other uh, CoAC members uh, goes into the plants and eats fruit and tubers, especially when the, when the plants are young like corn, uh, the damage is more uh, expected on those very young plants and it, it uh, eats around the base of those plants and you will see dead heart, hearts or, or dying plants uh, in, the, in the field. Uh, and detection is key. Uh, pitfall traps can be used and uh, it, uh, serving is, is critical for this test as well. Uh, some of these sources, uh, uh, you can bring these samples to, the, to our research centers uh, that, that are neighboring to you extension agents uh, with the UF. Uh, and then uh, also there are other uh, sources uh, these all from uh, US, uh, their plant diagnostic network too, and then definitely uh, with the FDEX uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jamal. Um, there's some printouts from uh, FDEX website of uh, fruit flies up here. So if you want, you can put one during the break or during lunch. Um, if I guess if you're a UF person and you want one, I didn't print enough for everybody. So if you're a UF person, hold off and we can always print you some more. Um, so next up, we're gonna get into some nematodes and um, pathogens of concern. And I'm gonna start us off with that um, before um, Dr. Oscar, Oscar um, Bootman talks about some of the viruses. And remember part of the, the point of all this is to understand you know, not to be an expert in identifying all these things, but to have some idea of what to be looking for. So when you see something that you're not used to seeing on a regular basis, um, you might be a little bit more uh, aware and, and make sure you're then pulling other people into the picture um, at the university and state level. So some nematodes and pathogens of concern for us. Uh, we're gonna start with the um, pale cyst nematode. Uh, this is native to South America. Um, it was found in Idaho in 2006. Um, it's a major pest of most of our solanaceous crops. Um, in addition to potato, it can cause um, pretty drastic yields, 20 to um, 70%. Um, and early detection is important to prevent um, spreading and rotating potatoes with um, non-host crops. Another one that is quite similar to it is the golden nematode. And uh, this one is native to South America. It's found in New York in 1940. Um, 
again, major pest of Solanaceae. This cyst can, um, the kind of hardened body of it, the overwintering body can live in the soil for 30 years. Um, so this is why um, these two different cyst nematodes um, together, both of them have very long um, viability in the soil and why they're very important because um, it, it's a huge long-term impact. Um, so a little bit, this is the um, juvenile form. Uh, the pale cyst nematode, uh, this is a picture on some of the roots. Um, you can kind of tell why they call it the pale one and the golden one, um, a little self-explanatory. Um, but that's what it, it's like on some roots. Um, these are the cysts that form. And uh, these cysts can have um, 200 to 600 eggs in each cyst. Um, and so these here are the J2s that have um, developed and come out of them. So um, <clears throat> it can reproduce rapidly, can last for a long time. And that's why this is a pest uh, that we pay attention to. So um, APHIS and, and state officials um, in Idaho and New York have examined hundreds of thousands of soil samples. It's basically isolated to two small geographic areas, um, two counties in Idaho and eight counties in New York. Um, so the program that they implement, this is kind of an example of, of why um, these programs are important. So they, their aim, of course, is to prevent the spread to uninfested fields. Um, the restrictions cover the movement of plants in soil um, with required sanitation procedures for your equipment. And because of this program and what they've put in place, they've been able to prevent spread and minimize crop losses um, with these protocols uh, by adding a lot long-term crop rotations um, and preventing the spread. We now have it contained to these um, small areas. So um, the only thing that's good to know is that producers in these regulated areas are still able to ship products interstate, uh, interstate, interstate, and internationally as long as they are following these programs. So um, just because you're in a, in a program where monitoring a pest doesn't mean that you are completely shut down. Um, and obviously it, because they're doing that, that's protecting our industry here. Another example, I'm on the potato side of things, is potato wart. Um, this is a fungal pathogen that uh, majorly affects tomato crops, um, originated in South America. Um, it was has been previously reported, uh, eradicated in US. It is present in Canada right now. This is another one that has a very long um, viability. It can remain in the soil um, for 30 years, and it produces these kind of gnarly warts on the on the potatoes and um, stolons, and um, it yeah makes your makes your crop unmarketable, and there there is quarantine uh, effects with this. And so this example is kind of again how we've been protected from it. Um, so in October 2020, there was a new case confirmed in Prince Edward Island, Canada. Um, no pot uh, potatoes left the field that season, um, so it was all quarantine, but they also went and said, okay, well, we don't know if it came in, uh, if it started this year with whatever seed potatoes that they had, or if it's been in the soil, you know, for a couple of years and they've been shipping out of it. So um, APHIS was, um, got records of all previous shipments um, from this location, and um, they quarantined and suspended potato exports um, from from Canada to here. So a lot of our seed potatoes, for those you don't know, a lot of our seed potatoes are coming from there. Um, <clears throat> so in May, 2021, um, FDAC CPI identified four farms in St. John's County who had purchased seed potatoes from Prince Edward Island. Um, and thankfully the samples came back negative. Um, in April, 2022, um, they kind of uh, amended this federal order and basically saying, we're still pro prohibiting the importation of field-grown um, sea potatoes from Prince Edward Island, but now we're allowing the importation of tomatoes for consumption, um, as long as they meet specific conditions. So this is an example of how this is, has benefited us, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll continue to. And, and this is what, um, the, at the national level, APHIS and, and FDAX, what they do on, on your behalf, behind the scenes that we usually don't know about. Uh, the last one that I wanted to mention is bacteria wilt. Um, this is Ralstonia solanaceum, race three, BioVar two. So we have bacteria wilt here. It's race one. It has a large host range. Um, it's endemic, just means it's, it's all over the place here in the U.S. Um, many of you are probably used to seeing that. 
Um, race three is found worldwide except for here in the US and Canada. Um, major crops are Solanaceae crops and um, geraniums. Um, these are have to um, only survive on a living host. So the only way they can really make it here is on seed stock for potato or um, cuttings of geranium. Um, thankfully, they're not on seeds of tomatoes. Um, and the your symptoms from race three to race one are completely indistinguishable. There's no way to know um, if what you, one you have in your field. So, so what makes it different? Um, race three is found in more climatic zones, whereas race one is a little bit more limited. Um, so particularly in the colder environments, but it, it's also in tropics and subtropics, which is us. Um, soil fumigants and antibiotics are largely ineffective. Um, cultivars that we've developed to be resistant to race one, um, particularly on the tomato side of things, have not been greatly effective um, to race three biovar two. Um, worldwide damage estimates for this pathogen are about one billion dollars annually. Um, so again, this is why it's important. So so what does this all mean? So so my suggestion is, look, pay attention to um, changes that you may see in your variety susceptibility. If you have one variety that's usually susceptible and all of a sudden for some reason it's not, well, let's start asking questions. Let's, you know, if you're on the potato side of things, uh, where was, this, was the seed stock source? Um, how, you know, so that we can then potentially send it off to a lab for uh, um, diagnosis. So that's what I have for our, our nematodes and some of our diseases. Oscar, you can come and share about um, viruses for vegetables. Good morning, everyone. Yep. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Oscar Butcherman, a citrus pathologist, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm working also on viruses for uh, uh, some other crops. Um, my presentation, by the way, I like to do it. It's not only thanks to my brother as much. <laughs> I just wanted to show some beautiful pieces of viruses. I love viruses, so it's time to look at these green isomers of how viruses can be detected. So three messages I brought with me today. One, you cannot recognize viruses by symptom alone. Okay, and I'll prove with some uh, with the some slides. I'll show you that it's almost impossible. Second, you can always find someone who can test if you don't know how to use immunoscripts, because there are immunoscripts everywhere that you can use and test quickly in the field if you have virus diseases or not, okay? So these two messages, please do not think by looking at the symptom, this is tomato mosaic virus, this is brown rugose virus, you cannot distinguish, okay? And I know this, I'm very much, very much experienced and sometimes in the field, I go nuts and scratch my head. I don't know what to say, okay? And I'll show you why. So um, as you can see the numbers, over 300 virus and virus-like diseases attacks tomatoes, okay? And we don't have that many of diseases here in our tomatoes. It's been potential exist. And some of the diseases that I'm going to talk about today, seed transmitted. And where we produce those seeds, all over the world, where these pathogens are damaging the entire uh, industries in that uh, country, okay? So these are seed transmitted and also easily transmitted by touching. Even when you are scouting in the field, looking, just the odd looking plant, touching and to see what is in there, you have already in your finger. That cyst nematode that uh, Craig showed 30 years can stay uh, in the soil. These viral particles also can stay in the soil 30 years. So you are the first people who will most likely encounter in the field. That's why I wanted to bring you some visual so that you can see and think when you get across with such symptoms so you can bring um, those specimens to us to confirm uh, if those are the exotic viruses or those that we have here in Florida. Who can recognize virus diseases here? I changed the names. I'm fooling you. 
let me know if the names corresponds to the pictures are true, raise your hand. If it's false, raise your hand. You don't know? All right, as you can see, different viruses, by the way, names are correct. Uh, I didn't change anything. Uh, symptoms are alike, right? So it's almost impossible. But to me, I can tell that some nuances exist. If you look at the tomato spotted bill, spotted bill, right? Beautiful ring spot. And not exist in others, but the fruit mirbling or uneven ripening, it's characteristic of many of the viruses, okay? So you cannot just decide if you have brown rugos or mosaic virus, okay? One thing though, you can tell if, the, if you have Tobama viruses, and if your variety is very susceptible, you will have shoe spring like malformed leaves, elongated leaves. They are not looking like tomato leaves. So that can give you a clue that might be Tobama virus, okay? And we have four of those Tobama viruses here in Florida causing exactly the same symptoms. And brown glucose virus, we don't have it in Florida. So if it comes, we will not be able to tell the difference by looking at the symptoms. So you have to have a, some sort of test. Sometimes it's caused very mild symptoms. It's almost impossible to distinguish between the healthy and infected. And in fruits especially, by the way, I, I brought some fruits infected with tomato brown rugose virus, if you haven't seen it. You will not see the symptom until that fruit is ripened and there is you know, uh, discoloration or uneven ripening. So I brought some more pictures. Uh, these are the brown rugose infected tomatoes. These tomatoes are actually having resistant gene. Hence, the, the symptoms are a little different. There is a shoe spring symptom. Do you see any shoe spring symptom here? No, but it's a cl classic symptoms of Tobama viruses where we don't see it here. But if you look at the leaves, you will see this green modeling, mosaic and you know different colored uh, pattern. I don't know if my, okay, here it is. All right, so the, if you look at the leaves, dark and green modeling on the leaves. If you look at the calyx area, some necrosis may occur, okay? And on the peduncles and the pedicles, some necrosis as well. In fruits, you don't see any symptom until it's ripened and is miscolored, okay? So in the field, please pay attention. Stunted growth and some sort of discoloration on the leaves should indicate you, you may have a virus disease. If there is a necrosis, most probably is not associated with the seed transmitted viruses that we do have and we don't have. So necrosis will not have on this class. Can anyone recognize what fruits on these clusters are infected with virus? By the way, this is tomato brown fruit rugose virus that you may have in your stomach already, but we don't have in Florida. Where you can find, by the way, here, your neighborhood grocery. If you look at the tomatoes that coming from Mexico or Canada, and I am shopper, and I cannot help myself not to look tomatoes when I'm going in the grocery store. So as you can see here, this is the package. And uh, if you look at the left side, this colored fruit, that cluster is completely infected with tomato brown fruit virus. We don't have that rugose virus here, okay? Same here. And I'm suspecting those three big, large tomatoes are infected also a pepinium mosaic virus that we don't have it. These are seed transmitted and easily transmitted by touching, okay? And again, I will remind you now, we are lucky that we have immunostrip that specifically detects brown fruit rugose virus, okay? So it's like COVID test that you do. You can do this in the field to make sure that you have brown rugose or something else. Tomato spotted built virus, you are mostly uh, familiar because we do have here. Uh, one thing to distinguish tomato spotted built with other Tobama viruses, again, necrosis associated with the tomatoes in the foliage and in the fruit, 
bumpiness and discolored uh, portion with usually beautiful concentric rings. So this is classic TOSPO virus. Again, immunostrips are available for this. Please use it. Well, our concern is resistant breaking strain of this virus, we don't have it in Florida. And I know some of growers are here using SW5 tomato varieties, which are resistant to TOSPO viruses, but it still can cause damage on those resistant. That's why we are a vigil vigilantly looking. And if you got uh, SW5 variety tomatoes, and if you see necrosis and TOSPO like symptoms, especially in the foliage, it might be a resistant breaking, okay? So please let us know. Um, and in SW5 fruits, SW5 tomato varieties, sometimes you will not see any TOSPO like necrosis symptoms on the foliage, but on the fruit where thrips are feeding, you will have still this ring spot because SW5 gene is not well expressed in the fruit and symptoms can happen on the SW5 varieties. I'm running late, right? Yeah. One more disease and I will stop. I will not go to the potato, but this one is very important because I fear that this will come very soon. Uh, this is cucurbit green model mosaic virus. This is the cousin of tomato viruses that I talked, especially brown virus, mosaic, toma tomato brown, uh, tomato brown <laughs> fruit reverse virus, uh, tobacco mosaic virus and tomato mosaic virus cousins with this, but this one infects cucurbits. And you can see they can cause very mild modeling symptoms, hence the name, okay? And this can, this can happen on leaves and later on the maturation on the fruit. This is cucumbers and here melons, okay? Some more, this is what you, what you need actually. When you are starting in the field, if you see stunted growth, please get closer and try to look at the apical part of this stunted plant and you will be able to see some modeling. And here is the close up picture. It's actually, it's easily recognizable, but you cannot distinguish this symptoms with potty cause, potty virus cause symptoms, okay? They all look like same. So please use immunostrip, okay? Here is later before harvest, you can see the cucumber, uh, it's off colored compared with the healthy one and some severe symptoms on newly developing shoots. In watermelon, the thing is worse. You will not know if you have this disease until you harvest it and cut this fruit or not, okay? But you can always look at the leaf to see if there is a modeling in the early stages or some sort of necrosis in the uh, the stem or the, the part closer to the fruit, okay? With this, I will stop. I will not go to the potato zebra chip next time. <laughs> if you have any question, I'll be around and I have some specimen here. These are the brown angles, infected tomatoes, purchased from our neighbor who's working here in the morning. Please do not touch the water and go to the field, okay? Thank you. Thanks. All right, so next up, so that was the end of our vegetable side of things. Now we're gonna transition to citrus and um, Callie Walker is gonna talk with us. She's gonna get to do everything from the insect side to the disease side. So uh, swap, you should be, I have no idea actually. Let's see. Yep. Good morning. Sorry about the video. Um, so, like Craig said, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we did to make this work this morning. Um, and <laughs> two minutes? Two, 20 minutes. Okay. Well, I got a lot of slides, so hopefully uh, I'll make it. If, otherwise, I'll get the hook. Um, so um, I'm kind of going to first talk about, about the diseases we currently have in Florida within the citrus industry, um, kind of talk about them real briefly. Um, th probably these are the three uh, main that you see in the state of Florida that's the biggest driver for production costs, um, grower issues, build conditions, loss of 
income, you name it. Um, of course, Citrus Black Spot, we do have a what we call a geographical quarantine for. It is a uh, fung fungal disease called Biophilia sitka citrus carpa. Um, it is a, a wind leaf litter debris um, mover. Um, it doesn't really, when it's splashed as first, doesn't move very far. It's not like canker that can really be pushed. Um, its movement is kind of short to the next tree. That's kind of how it, it's kind of like an insidious creep. Uh, citrus black spot is actually, there's two types in the world. Uh, we only have one, the asexual type, not the mating type, which is every other country or every other country in the world that has CBS has those mating types. That would be South Africa, Australia, Brazil, pretty much, um, I don't think Mexico has it yet. So, um, but anyway, that does occur, occur in Florida. That came in 2010. We have citrus canker, of course, which we have eradicated once got to where within we were about six weeks of eradication a second time um, when we had four hurricanes show up in our state and blew all the work that we had done right out the window and we became uh, basically a statewide quarantine for uh, canker. Um, it isn't really it doesn't prohibit movement in any way there's no special conditions for it to move. Um, other than you should be decontaminating in your grove so that you're not spreading it it is like very, very, very transmissible. You think you're not touching anything, but yet it's kind of like the, the the video where you like, yeah, I'm gonna put you know a chemical on your hand. How much do you touch your face? You really don't realize how easy it moves. And once it moves, it moves. CBS also, because of the uh, quarantine, there are decontaminations for that and requirements for fruit movement. It doesn't, it doesn't keep you from moving it, but there are rules and regulations about moving it. Citrus screening, of course, is the biggest, baddest disease we currently have, um, which has had the hugest economic impact to the industry today. Um, it is transmitted by the vector of the Asian citrus psyllid. Um, it is a bacterial disease, um, and which causes that blotchy modeling that everybody knows by now. It looks like somebody beat up your tree, it looks all bruised up. It's asymmetrical, it ignores the lateral veins type thing. With canker, when you're looking at it, most people know exactly what it is, but for those who've never been in a citrus grove, it's always the halo. Um, that halo is very reminiscent of what happens. Once it gets to the further disease on the fruit, then it begins this corkiness that you'll see through it. And of course, citrus black spot. This is probably the pygidium. This is the pygidium that causes the disease, but um, it's also, once you get to see it, you'll it's very recognizable in the field. Um, these are other diseases that we currently have. This last one is uh, sweet orange scab. The unique thing about that um, is that while we have a quarantine for sweet orange scab, when we test fruits, mostly coming from residential, what you see is this, this symptomology here um, for scab. It's not, does, I mean, it doesn't degrade the interior part of the fruit, um, but this one, when we did the DNA work um, in Gainesville with Dr. Sun, Sun um, ours is not sequenced identical to what you see at the top of sweet orange scab. Um, and so therefore the identicalness of it isn't the same as what, as what we see in other places in the world. Um, other diseases real quick that we also have, which are very similar, greasy spot, which is a fungal pathogen as well. Um, it's smooth, it's slightly raised, it's got a greasy look to it. You, you turn it over, you can see it really well. Um, also gets on the fruit. Um, and and anthracnose, which is a colorectum, it's a fungal disease. It's an opportunistic pathogen. Um, it's usually the secondary inv invader. You've had a wind scar, you've had something else happen to the fruit, and this fungal pathogen will attach, and that's why you get um, kind of like that buckshot look on the leaves. Um, and on the fruit. Melanose, of course, is also, it's a fungal pathogen as well. You'll hear fungal a lot in citrus as well. Um, it's kind of got like a fried egg pattern to it. You kind of like the center would be the yolk and you kind of like have this kind of weird clearness around it. You see it in the picture a little bit. Um, it's a very sandpapery feel to it. Um, and alternaria as well, which is a fungal pathogen. Um, it has these narcotic the great thing about all of these diseases with their, their fungal is that we do have materials that do work to control them. 
Um, it's just a timing issue, um, you know, because fungal diseases like warm, wet, heat. Anyway, so a lot of these can be controlled. The same with CBS, the same with canker. We do have materials that are there that will help. But none of these diseases interfere with your movement of material from your field to a packing house or a processor for either domestic or international movement. There is rules, especially for CBS, but the rest of them are not. So citrus viruses. Um, citrus viruses are probably the smallest and the simplest pathogens that we have. Um, they're um, dependent on having a living host in order to replicate. They don't replicate on their own. Um, this is, um, these are two examples uh, here of, um, of actually leprosis. And that's the first one I'll talk about. So citrus leprosis um, is among one of the most economically important ones that we have. Um, it does affect numerous citrus species. Um, it is caused by a complex of viruses and they can be present either in the cytoplasm or the nucleus of the affected cells. So what does that mean? So there means basically there's two types. You have citrus leprosis C type and N type. They each show and present a little differently, but they are, um, and the reason why is because of where they affect in the plant. Um, so um, it is, the C type is more prevalent, it is the more aggressive type. Um, the N type is um, a more limited uh, distribution. Um, and the viral particles are present in both the nucleus and the cytoplasm, whereas the other one is not. Um, citrus leprosis, um, this disease actually was in Florida in the 1860s. It was last reported in, in, in 1968. Um, they think that that one, the last one in the recent study suggests that when we had it, it was the end type of the disease. The disease for leprosis is very well established, established through Mexico, the Caribbean islands. And um, and it will it is threatening to us whether it's California, Texas, or Florida. I will say this: we have had regulated incidences of leprosis in Florida since 1968, but nothing came of it. It didn't really affect anything. We couldn't find it. It was there. It was gone. Not only have we had this incident where we have seen this disease pop up, we've also seen it pop up of during the same season in California and in uh, Texas, or I mean, excuse me, Arizona and Texas. Um, so in that, in both cases, it didn't really impact the grower or the, his ability to move it. And we, you know, basically nothing came of it because basically when we found it and we went in to, to look at it, we had our lab people in, um, we couldn't, we haven't been able to see it again. We haven't seen it since. Uh, citrus leprosis is a vector disease by mice, so it's helpless. As you can see here, in its different stages, eggs, larvae, nymph, and adult. Um, you will not see these under a field lens. They are too small. The only way you will see Grevel's helpless is if you're under the microscope. And, and you're going to be looking through a lot of leaf litter debris in order to find them. So abandoned groves, that ability is really... Um, is really where some of the harboring can come. They don't move very fast. Um, you know, they grow with palpus, they feed on the lesion, and as if they have leprosis in them and they continue to feed, how they continue to spread is because they're feeding and re-inoculating themselves and their progeny over time, which allows a slow, insidious creep to the tree because it's got to maintain that feeding mechanism. If it breaks, it breaks the virus. I always tell people, and this is probably why we have the regulated incidents that we did, is that some, we broke, the grower broke the virus because he applied the materials, it killed the mice. Grover palpus is not the king of the mite world. They're kind of the bottom of the barrel. Everything beats up on them. They're not very sustainable. And once you break that, you break the cycle. So that's one of the important things about it as, uh, as far as managing for that with Grover palpus. Um, I know that when I talk to our staff up in Gainesville in the lab, and uh, Sam Bolton is who does all of our mite work. Um, you know, Florida probably is at the northernmost range for this particular mite, even though we do have it. It is present. So um, this is the C-type. Um, you'll notice that you have this green center um, in the leaf. 
you kind of like this yellowing around it as it advances out and we get the scumminess that accumulates on the leaf structure and up in the pedicle. Um, but the disease is not systemic. It is really to where that that part is. That is where the disease is. It's like having a chicken park pox mark on you. Kind of like there it is. That's where it's at. Um, this is another picture, kind of, of the same thing where you see the node, the green center, yellow halo. This was in Texas, actually. Um, it was a kind of a regulated incident because they were not able to confirm it uh, in the USDA lab. Um, but it, it put it close to the C type of the disease. Um, this is the N type um, of leprosis, and you'll notice that the if you look at the leaves, you kind of have this more necrotic look coming along in the center of the yellow halo. Um, its most uh, sensitive host is sweet orange, um, although it is also on Lyme's grapefruit lemon, and some of them are more tolerant to the disease, um, to the C type diseases, um, but are susceptible to the N. And again, it's that you know, that sclerotic look, that uh, immediate orange halo, and then that necrotic center um, once you see it. Um, these are out of Mexico. These are pictures that we got from the USDA out of Mexico. Um, that's on the Mexican key line. These are in type as well. Um, and you can see on the stems here, you see the lesions coming to the stems. Um, again, we... I have never in the field seen this this, this part of it, but um, you can start to see we're in this early rust color um, of the, of the, as the disease progresses in the trees, you kind of get that part going on. And then um, as, it's, as it basically progresses, it'll start to scale the branches as well. I mean, that's a pretty serious infection um, as well, but that's a poor, more advanced. This is what it looks like on a fruit. Um, it kind of has that weird marking, and you've got that yellow, green, yellow, green. As it ages out, you get to this red kind of look to it. Um, the first one is kind of the, um, is the first early stages of it, which kind of makes it weird. It's like where the mite fed on the, or where it was on the fruit itself. Um, under high temperatures, you start to have that center kind of get to necrotic and they tear apart. This is actually citrus canker. Um, so you see kind of the differences between the two. Um, citrus yellow lane clearing disease. Um, this is another one. Um, is, um, it has been reported in India, Pakistan, Turkey, China, uh, Iran, and other places. Um, in the spring of this year, California found it in the residential part of Tulare County. They are currently under delimiting and have set quarantine for non-movement of material because of this disease. Um, it is, is it a pathogen that's found in the phloem and it can be vectored by citrus whitefly and aphids, which we both know is a very popular insect in the state of Florida. So we already have the vector here, we just don't have the disease. As you see, Brevipalpus we have, we just don't have the disease. When you have the vector, you're halfway there to the home run, which you don't want. Um, it affects most species of uh, citrus and its relatives, but it's mainly lemons and you know sour orange. The great thing about citrus or about detecting citrus vein gel clearing disease, when, we were, when um, we've been in our meetings, and these are the pictures out of California just in this year, you see this very clear lining of of loss of green in the leaf. And that is that strong lateral vein and it's clearing its way out. The green, it's going kind of white. When you get it in the right sunlight, it is like a beacon in the night. You cannot miss it. Um, it's a very easy disease to see in the field by all accounts from our partners at the USDA. Um, you'll see round or elongated green as it, on the underside, it'll get to like a watermark um, on the underside leaf of it. And then you have this kind of that crinkling. If you look at the top, you see that crinkling kind of ribbon edge that you see at the top. Um, these are some more pictures out of uh, California. They were on lemon trees in uh, California as well. The other unique thing is that it will, the, the deep light up there, um, Satsuma mandarin in China shows, resembles a pumpkin. It starts to get that pumpkin look around it where you get these lines in the fruit. Um, so again, 
um, the disease reduces yield and, of course, marketability. Because right now, if you get it, like in California, you can't move any of the material once they set the quarantine. Um, CVC um, is um, a xylem limited bacterial, xylella, xylella placidosa, um, subspecies. Um, can't say the last word, and I'll just admit it. Um, but anyway, we have a very we have other Rosiella facidosis varietal or subspecies um, in the state of Florida, but um, this is the one for citrus. Um, it's ranked eight out of the ten most most important plant pathogen bacteria. That's the picture. Um, again, unfortunately, we already have the vector here to help spread the disease, and that's the glossy wing and the blue wing sharpshooter. So we do have the vector here. Um, and, um, so again, it's, it's, it's something that we have to maintain. And when you're doing IPM or anything else, um, it's important to know what you have in your field, to know which vectors you have. Those are very well seen. Um, this one, again, you have very bright, um, bright notes on the leaves that show CBC. Um, sweet oranges are the most susceptible. Um, and it primarily affects younger trees. But again, it's a very, um, you can very, very much see where they're, where that virus is sitting there. Um, here's the difference between like an actual zinc deficiency. And I think it's a good point because, you know, most of, with zinc deficiency system symptoms, they're always symmetric in pattern of the yellow areas between the veins. And the biggest thing about chlorosis is it's, it, li it is limited to space, it's limited to the spaces between the veins. So you're not, where you have this very symmetrical thing, it's kind of like um, uh, HLB, you know, where it models, but in this case, it will only show that, that, that clearing part will only be between the veins. It won't be on the veins of the leaf. Um, so, you know, it can look like a deficiency, um, especially when the symptoms are first appearing. Um, here's some more symptoms of the leaf. As the disease progresses, you'll start to get the um, top of the leaf will turn to bright yellow. But again, it's all about limiting it to the spaces between the veins. Um, but, and here's some more. As to the underside, it'll go to that gummy light brown um, lesions on the backs of the leaves so that they're correlating from the white on the front to the gummy on the back. And then, of course, as it ages out, um, it'll start to necrotic, and that's what you see here. It'll start to turn that rusty brown color on the on, on it. Um, usually, clusters. That's one of the other things about this disease, um, especially in early maturing. It makes everything really small, hard, um, and you just can't market it. It'll make your crop um, um, unmarketable at that point. So, uh, I made it. I'm sliding into home plate. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I do want to thank a lot of the pictures and stuff came from um, our Dr. Pecker. He's in Gainesville, and then from our partners at USDA. That was one of the slides. Thanks, Kelly. Let's go ahead and squeeze in a five minute break so folks can use the restroom. Um, we'll start back up at 10.53. So now you got, yeah, 10.54, we'll start back up, five minutes. Um, and we'll go from there. So um, restrooms are out the door, past reception um, on the left. And don't forget to thank our sponsor. Um, and then we'll move on with our presentation. Next up, we get to hear some from some scientists who are from Spain, who have come here to Southwest Florida um, to continue their research. And you'll see very quickly how it ties into our topic today uh, about management of invasive pests um, and what they're doing. So I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Alberto, uh, please welcome Alberto um, as he introduces himself and shares with us. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for the invitation, Craig. It's a great pleasure for us to, to be here and to present part of the work that we have conducted in Spain in vegetables and also in citrus for more than 20 years. And we expect that some of our research is useful for you because we have already uh, worked and meet some of the most different tests for us. I think that's really fun. So for example, today we will talk a bit about how we are managing tooth absoluta under our conditions and also other things. Well, what we are doing here in Imokali. So very tapered, a researcher from uh, my institute and myself, we are conducting a full by the state. We are dealing with this and it can be compressing strain. So we are trying to uh research some of the uh, ideas for uh, solutions that we think that can improve the uh, management of citrus. Uh, we are hosted by Dr. Javad uh, Karesi and Dr. Fernando Pérez. We are very happy to be with them. And then, sorry, because we have the facilities in this week, uh, at the Spain, and also increasing for collaborating with the project that we have done uh, here in the center. Okay. We will talk a bit about our both here at Victoria and the other participation. But, uh, well, where we are from? We are from Spain. Uh, we are located here in South. Uh, well, in the middle east of Spain, in Valencia. We are from Valencian Institute of Agricultural Research. We are located in the middle of the citrus area or citrus region of Spain. Valencia, uh, Valencia has almost 200,000 hectares of citrus. That is around uh, 600,000 acres or less. So uh, our work uh, or institute is more mainly focused on citrus, but also on the uh, this is my outline. Our line, we are going to talk about what is occurring in Europe nowadays. You will see that our pest management is totally different than we have right here in the US. Okay. And uh, then uh, we will give two examples the super, super pest and tomato uh, pest management. Two systems, maybe there is in biological control. We will see which is our best friend. This system that has shown the top of the skeleton. We will talk a little about uh, this. And then finally, we will talk a bit about uh, citrus uh, in Spain. And obviously, what we are doing here in the spread with the uh, citrus management. Well, Spain uh, has uh, almost 2 million hectares of fruit and vegetables. And uh, from this, uh, the production is mainly 61% vegetables. Citrus, as you can see, the most important fruit uh, crop in Spain, and the rest, well, is some fruit and other uh, 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 The two most important, tomato and pepper, they are integrated in protecting crop, but also in other okay? So we have a similar, we have some areas with similar production systems that we have here in Victoria. Uh, what is occurring now in Europe, especially in Spain? Spain is the garden of Europe. We produce a lot of vegetables, but the mainly uh, uh, destination is Europe. Almost 80% of the production is exported to Europe, not Europe. Okay? We are Europe, not Europe. So, from, from many years ago, we need to produce safe and clean. Safe and free of the pesticides. This is the key of our, our system. Indeed, in 2009, 2009 was mandatory to produce all our fruit production under IBM to use the less amount of pesticides as possible. Indeed, IBM nowadays is the only way to produce fruit under the table. You have to certify what the government has have to certify. That the production is conducted under IBM. IBM, and in the last years, also organic farming is increasing in its But this is not all. 2019, the European Commission launched the European Green Deal. That means that they want that there is a neutral balance of greenhouse gas emissions 
for 2050. And a major component of this uh, gas, uh, greenhouse gas emission is agriculture. They have one more step, and they have launched in May 2020 the uh, new regulation from farm to fork. The farm to fork is to transform all the agri model into a fair, healthy, and environmentally friendly model. They want sustainable agrarian system. And they are advising lower emission to look the solution to find that the best and difficulties in the country. We're going to talk about a bit about super. Super is a paradigmatic example of best management in respect. We have similar values that we have here in the We have two key best, and we have simultaneous tips and what like the easier uh, Well, I'm not going to talk about this. You know, probably uh, the Western Flower trips, like the era uh, of Sedentaris, and also the Nisera. Most pests were almost impossible to fight the pesticide. We had a high pressure of these two pests, both in the petit floor and also in the houses. Okay? Indeed, we have a lot of problems and restrictions from Europe. So we export or we do uh, northern European countries, analyze our food, and then get the protective pesticides. They cut the potential, and for us, all we need to work at the same One country can only cut the production, and only the top one area, they stop all the information from the world. So, uh, because chemical control was no longer provided as a good control method against this test, well, we developed biological control. And now, I want to talk about the children in Switzerland. We have this predatory uh, mite, and the same industry, which is produced by many companies, okay? Uh, is released in the first stages of the Switzerland plant. The other plant is that the plant is in the crop. Uh, each plant is probably one of these subjects. One of these actually we have around 200 miles. They will go in, they exit from this packet, and they will analyze the crop. And the second system is a perfect natural enemy of water. Okay? And then we have Orius Arrogatus. Orius Arrogatus is in this jacket where flowers appear in the crop. We do this, this kind of boxes, we have this box on the Bottom part of the plant and on the bottom part of the floor, that will be more important, and then more importantly, on the solution to the water. Look at this. This is the this should be the situation of every single thing out in Spain. And the serious Swiss key is released just at the beginning of the block. You can see just at the beginning. The percentages of flowers occupied by this mite is very high. All these aggregates is released in the flowers, you see, and increase its population. Leaves, the part you have here the percentage, when all these aggregates pass over 20% of the that we have to make it, there is no problem of okay. This was a mess. And if we translate this results to our uh, soup pepper production, you can see in the two main areas where soup pepper is produced, are produced, you can see Mutia and Dante with almost 2,000 hectares of soup pepper. In the end of the 90s, you can see that in just two years, the 100% of the pepper is with In our real area, um, 8,000 hectares of the food pepper. It was a little bit more difficult because it's more high, it's more similar to the Florida. And thanks to all these issues, in just one year, you can see the uh, impacts of the clinical flowers are the of the Okay, this is what I told you. Nowadays, everything is conducted mainly used to natural enemies. But please, look at this graph. You can see in 2002 2007, uh, less than 10% of the food was conducted with biological In 2007 2009, 
biological contract, and if you can see these two years, this is very interesting. This is an independent laboratory from Germany in 2006, when still the energy was in the biological contract, we exported with uh, maximum residue levels of pesticides in the field. No, positive because it's not, it's not possible to export, but it's still present on the field. Look the year that the is nothing, and also okay. So this was a big success that was also uh, exported to the world. Forward, and now uh, we, uh, we're going to talk about tomato. Okay, what are you in tomato? In tomato, we have a soft IPA program, basic and pesticide. Because the uh, water price and the same things in the future, not learning that we can do a year with the green matter, is not possible to walk or to make it. I mean, it's not possible to do it. So it was a little bit more difficult to find a doctor to make it. So for them, uh, they had to use selective pesticides to bundle, bundle this pollinator. It's very common in Spain. So, uh, just few releases of natural enemies uh, work. However, in 2006, everything <laughs> The South America, we want to have a look at a period of Spain, okay, uh, and the old programs that we have in the years were because we go forward to increase against Cuba Absoluta. And the reason, Cuba Absoluta, we can. Imagine that it's the same than any of these activities. It actually was a total disaster for the domestic production, not only the same, also of other nations in the country, also of the countries, or the etc. And uh, I'm not going to talk about, about, about a lot about the education, already uh, the paper is in the uh, uh, slides, but I can give more information, of course. This is the, the adult. Uh, the male and the female, yes, this is important for the understand for the management. Yes, are the way and the article part of the particular plan. The meaning of the okay, might be on the line. For the library, okay, this is also important for the test. The library can enter with the community. It can pass to the Nightmare of the uh, of test. Okay, this is some picture of the, the damage in the, in the group, and uh, this is the first picture of the was detected in the state. Okay, this is very difficult to see the new trust with the this is the of the armies. This is very common to identify. So damage is in the leaves. Good. Okay. Well, as I told you previously, IBM was disrupted. The cost of the production was increased. So there was a good uh, <coughs> need to develop friendly tech for the uh, exportation. So well, and here we have the solution. As I told you, this is the first. To make your crop where good absoluta was detected in the stem. In the same crop, an open field the method, we detected this predatory mean. This is the police stem. Okay. We have experience with this predatory mean because we were testing for the test it against one place in tomato, it was very effective, very, very effective, but had some concerns. We can produce the analysis from the, the habitual part of the tomato. And also, we need uh, food on the crop to maintain its population. Okay? So, if there is no food, we can produce the market. So, growers were not uh, totally convinced that when we use a machine, we don't sell it in the winter crop, so this is the thing. So, this is the thing. This is the thing. However, well, we know that uh, this product was there. We were checking. It was possible to do it in the same way. It means it's a fabulous, relatable, two-touch with a head. 
lack of faith, it can't really be done. Okay? But in the next decade, we can talk about the genetic improvement of the community. We have also selected the new explain less to the genetic. So, our recommendation from Florida to make the numbers. Get ready. It's absolutely good about it. Okay? Uh, and under our opinion, a strategic basic on creatory limits is urgent to be Okay? Looking at what happened to the United States, the world, the two absolute countries in the United States, we can say that the best method is to have this creatory limit. There are other chemical treatments, there are pheromones, there are trapping, there are light, there are light. But a lot of this could be a method that they can say that the, the, the most technical thing is okay. not only because fit for people, but because these predators are for people. One is to have a better time to get out, they can develop a lot of work, they can develop a fire, they can develop a lot of work, they can develop a lot of work, they can develop a lot of work. So, I have this, and this is very important. There is also other benefits of using so important instrumental in the world. Okay? When we started to use these so important instrumental instrumental, we saw a lower incidence of that flight. So we first thought we were for the equivalent view for the equation. This is the whole family, mathematics, mathematics, instrumental in this or that one. Okay? Only. And look, there was something more than. We saw that these meetings, due to, to their important behavior, can induce plant defenses. That means that the plants, we will see the plants can defend themselves against that. They will need some volatiles, and these volatiles are relevant to what slides. Okay? So we uh, at this, okay, we checked several species for that. We also included two years ago, I think that we the technology uh, the controversy. We already uh, tested the Mamilopis Pilaricados, the species that we have here in the US. It's also able to be detected in that due to the information. Okay, so for different dimensions, very feedback. So Due to the, this feeding behavior, plants entering a stage of uh, what we call activated plants, that is called EU resistance, and put in two different uh, pathways, but can repel uh, this adaptive, for example, but also the hydroponic exit pathway can release volatiles that are attracted to natural. So we clearly demonstrated that a part of the chemical effect of the community, they can induce the health of plants. This is very positive. This is very positive because we have said that just only for this to top up with that for this capacity to induce defenses, plants are less susceptible, for example, for the transition to die, for the kids for the kids for the for the mind, because some genes related to defenses. Are a related initially the big for later. Okay. Well, all the things that we are talking about as well as I do explain it, what most of them are for you, for you, for you. We can check the individual and the links later. And it's good that we also see that plants that were exposed to the silicone screening, the defenses were activated. Obviously, in this plant, the silicone was activated. So this effect on the immature survival was just due to the huge effect on the plant. Okay? So additional uh, effect. And more importantly, I'm sure that the poor like this. Okay? We, we already discussed. This predatory meal through this induction of also can be by this in sweet pepper, we will do also a work with release these predators, Apolopus cumaeus and Sinopetus penis. And we saw that after induction of the defenses, plants that were exposed to both the 
we the the okay? We saw the graph is ready to see. This is the control when we do the present. This is with macronotus and this is with material. Okay? So we can tell this and also modulate the infection of and we have also established the value of the are also trying to find out if this is also possible. And more importantly, we have seen that we are able to use this But Probably you know that plant communicates each other. Plant sends messages each other to cell and take care. And we attack by a pet. It is a volatile communication. The plant can receive this volatile and it brings the plant to be ready for the social product. So we demonstrated that an induced plant. Induced by the recovery stainless in this case, and also the water in this particular limit, can be indifferent in the next good plan. Also, the induced plan was accidentally, and this plan has started protecting itself. Okay, so uh, we were able to identify the volatile of the plant diabetes after the period of the therapy leads. Okay, and we identified. Some of the volatiles responsible for this interaction. Okay? So, well, this is more basic information where we tested different volatiles, the dispenser, et cetera, et cetera. But this is very important because just for, by the position of the volatile, okay, we need to make a this is the volatile, the dispenser, and this is the dispenser. And you can see this is a heat map where the genes of the plant are uh, presented. You can see the profile of one plant of one treatment just by its position in one volatile in comparison to the plant. And more importantly, many genes involved in the fencing are regulated in this position. Okay, so we so okay, let's see if we can export this volatile to a system. In which we can use for a uh, pesto. Well, I'm not going to talk about this. Believe me, that exposed plants are going to be very and to attract natural the position. Okay. And this is what we want to do. So we develop a polymeric dispenser in which we introduce the weapon. This dispenser emits the weapon in area around 20 square meters. This is very similar to what we did and we conducted different experiments. For example, the one greenhouse, for the county, we invented with these dispensers. We obtained an activation of the problem that we want to do the density for more than the day. Just by the use of this dispenser, and what was more important, just with the use of this dispenser. We reduce the 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 on the plant. And the 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 <coughs> if nowadays uh, we have the patent of this dispenser, but nowadays there is still 20 years ago by one multinational company. Finally, best management in the Well, we have more than 300,000 hectares of equipment in Spain. We are the main producer of citrus in Europe and the first exporter of citrus for the press for the future. This is the uh, Florida. And our pest management is based on biological. And the next 
we are one, we are three, we are three of the Citrus are grown in the Mediterranean coast of the Yemen Peninsula, okay, and uh, for more than 120 citrus, we have all of the, the full picture: scales, heights, uh, aphids, spider mines, etc. Okay. We just have the uh, Two or three. Okay. Why? Because the major part of the digital aspects are controlled by natural energy. We have a problem that is the group of natural energy. We have methods for example, that we are going to be able to do a little bit of 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 a little bit a wide area management based on the SMP and the PCP that we have to do here. And we have to do that we have to do this and 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 we have to do it is a specific thing compatible with the system that we have. Because to register a product in the system, the main of the user is that this product has to be very safe. Okay? Right. So we are not in a positive, we don't have to do that. Okay? So this is how we're going to continue to create a space. Not only straight. All the things that I'm told you were too effective. However, last year, we can do more effective in the area. And now we are not so happy like the years ago. Anyway, you know that the uh, Asian Citrus Unit can be effective. But there are other vectors. There is the African Citrus Unit. And unfortunately, this vector was effective in the north of the country. Okay? In an area where Citrus are not present. We start with well, this, uh, this city is native from uh, South Africa. It was affected in Spain and Portugal in 2015. We and we start with a classic biological control in which we introduce one parasite. This is the symptomatology of the other type of the woman who is the producing city. But we decided to vote in the leaf, okay? But I would say it's not a problem. Anyway, we started a, a biological control program with Amalicia B and then this is with Amalicia Mariata, and the results fortunately were very uh, interesting. Very easy in 2018, and now in 2020, See of this policy on uh, the African citrus. This is an example. This is the citrus, the old classic, before the introduction of the Galicia uh, tree, and now we have a picture of it. It's not present. You can see also there the old symptomatology, and now the new plant. Okay. Well, to know more about uh, this is the old situation, we can this uh, communication. Okay, our citrus is this convert and explain the very old citrus. Well, and finally, we have a more great order. Now, what we are doing, what, what we are doing here, okay, so. Uh, uh, as I explained to you, both of us, and we are conducting uh, two independent projects by the aid of plant material and facility, and also you know, this invasion of defenses that we explained are effective among against HIV and the Aquilina uh, What about the plant material? And here, there is a reference to the beginning of the journal okay? We have a breeding program in 
long as the years, we have the evaluation more than 500 items from city and the city which are in the public. That are the limited that we now have for pain and the tolerance of the people and the city. So we have studied uh, all these uh, items. We are trying to evaluate and to classify the capacity of the user to produce, for example, HRV. And for example, this is continuous with the data, the index, but we have a huge battery of useful to start testing HRV and other. And this is part of the result of the other community right now. It's a piece uh, of a total study. But the you can see that we are testing some different things. If you go, this is our main good filter. This is the most important. Probably the 80% of the funds are converted to the And for that, I will use them and use them, but it will 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 use you can see that that often one step or another one, you can see a difference. Both parasitoids, the Marisa really, the Marisa really was attracted to this picture, and also the Marisa as well. Why did we tell us this? We have conducted the most important of our own interface. These two groups, another group, and we know, for example, that for the other time, in comparison to the African report, has a regulated pathways related to the health. This is the produce, the biosynthesis of the secondary metabolites. More than 80 of these that have a higher capacity to produce the health of the health against external aggression. Okay. Uh, well, we have some results on the other the CD. We see that there is, we have some candidates that are less adapted to, to this case to the CD. Respect to the CD and the CD and the CD and the And, uh, well, the point is, what about the first injection? This is what we are explaining. One will be the other. They are volatiles. We have a group of volatiles that we know that are able to induce. Uh, differences, okay, this is what we are explaining, this is a method. So, our question, it's possible using this dispenser to uh, enhance the capacity of the people that know against infection diseases, okay? So, uh, well, we did the same as the chronic analysis, the exposition of the volatiles, and the city is taught to do something for us. They can use defenses, again, you can see more than, one, more than 500 uh, are regulated that part of the position of the The part of the And again, you can see more than 50 genes that are regulated are connected with the biosynthesis of the global metabolism. It's very important that the plants are stronger against the infection. We tested with African C2C to see it, and you see that plants. Are less susceptible to the reposition of the African. It's very interesting. Okay. And again, this is the result that from 20 meters here, we see that plants produced by the volatile are less susceptible to uh, be attracted by the reposition of the reduced plants are prevalent at the level of the reposition. Here, of course, it is very difficult to do the same thing. But only we can do this. And this is what we want to do. We tested in Spain and again, Dolan diseases, millibars. This is now our new problem. We are against the six millibar. The ship is prepared to this use of the defenses. And many natural enemies are attracted to this plant. So we have a lot of results on this. And 
uh, three years ago, we were testing this. Uh, not the effect of the plant, we were working only on the volatile, but we saw here in the bread, we saw that plants with the uh, volatile were less that we were to the all the position of the uh, diaphragmatic. We want to complement to increase the results, okay? And uh, the another effect that has this, uh, well, this is just, I, I'm not going to get into this. We have people in the we have people in the world, people in the booster. This is an example that, uh, of the uh, activation of different gene uh, uh, and regulations, okay? The example of the position of this volatile, but we have a different plan, and we have the model for it. And now uh, we have also a brief collaboration with the other who has a very, very promising result with the grassy restaurants at the end of So now we have an experiment on, on, on going, in which we are combining the group of the Jonathan. We have Kelly Walker again. Um, she's going to talk about early detection and response. Um, so you've heard a lot about different pests and species. Sometimes when we think about new pests, we get worried and because all we think about is quarantine and that scares us. Um, but that's very few things are actually quarantine. And so I thought it would be helpful for Kelly to share a little bit about different things that may happen depending on um, different situations. So, go ahead. Thanks, Craig. Um, so uh, like Craig said, I'm going to talk about early detection and response. I know Craig also mentioned earlier that we had new quarantine detection states um, this spring, um, both with Oriental fruit fly and um, Chinese bees. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, so really, um, for those who don't really know what the Division of Plant Industries mission, job, and life is, is that we are literally protection through detection. That is, our, that is our mission. That is what we all try to do. And the reason is, is we are trying to protect Florida's native and commercially grown plants and the state's apiary industry from harmful pests and disease. We have a number of statutes in the state of Florida that between state statute, Florida state statute and our departmental rules really guide what we do, how we do and the steps that we have to take um, and give us the authority to set a quarantine, talk about a regulated area, have, have these conversations, how to certify crops for movement, um, issue limited permits and that type of thing. And these are the, just the state, state statutes that we currently run under. Um, that does not count the binder I have on my desk of departmental rule to follow behind it, but um, um, this, is, this is our guiding documents for us. It's what legally gives us the authority to implement. Um, Craig mentioned it earlier, you know, and while it's our, it is our responsibility at the Division of Plant Industry to protect the state's agriculture through our surveys and our inspections, whether they're at the interdiction station or in the grower field or in a nursery or in a box store or anything like that, 
It is also the responsibility of everyone who resides in the state of Florida. Everyone. Not just the grower, just the homeowner. It's everyone's responsibility to protect our state. And it is unlawful for any person to fail to disclose or withhold information regarding any infected or infested plant product, plant, or regulated article or noxious gene. It is, when I say it is everyone's responsibility, <laughs> we do have the ability to Not only do we have that responsibility and have that ability, but if it was the result of poor quarantine that affected the industry in the state of Florida, and we could prove that poor action was a result of us having to establish a quarantine program in the state of Florida, we have the statutory authority to charge you for every dollar you spend. If you look at Oriental Fruit Fly in the red one, it's a lot of money. It's millions of dollars. So it is people, it is one of those things that we that we talk about. It's things that we want people to be aware of. Um, because it is important um, for our state, its native flora and fauna and industry and our ability for to make sure that our industries, our ag industries, can move their materials that they need to across the state, U.S., and international. So, now that I got the heavy part out, we know that early detection is critical. Um, it is a very important part of preventing spread of pests and disease. Um, and it also uh, protects the state, protects its marketability, um, and, that and, and, it, and your ability to, whether it's domestic or international, like I said. That's why it's so important. We, we are, for vegetables, we are the winter capital of the world. I mean, we, we can push so much out. We grow so much. Even with citrus, even with all the challenges it has, we still have more and do more than California. We are still a very viable industry. And that's, with all of our issues, with all the issues that we have, we're billions of dollars of driver out of our ag community. And that's what we were trying to protect. So who is responsible for that within the Division of Plant Industry? Well, we have a number of people, um, a number of bureaus, mine included. Um, one is our PAC team. They do a lot of, they're our strike team. They're the guys that go out and they're in our state forests and they're out in sugar cane and they're out in tomato fields and they're out all over the state of Florida kind of looking for that issue that we haven't seen yet. They're looking for that exotic plant pest. They're, they're, that's their sole job. Um, they have certain survey targets that they look for. They, with nematodes, they do cotton bowl rule. They do a lot of lists of diseases that are there, that they're, that they're designed to deal with. Or if, hey, we have something else pop up, a lot of times we send our CAPS people in first to delineate and make sure that what we see in a sugarcane field or in a rice field or in a whatever is what it is. The Citrus Health Response Program is my bureau's responsibility, um, PEC. Um, we work with our cooperator, the USDA, and we're the ones that make sure through our multi-pest, fresh fruit, grower requests, citrus livestock surveys, we're the ones making sure that we find that early detection um, that may um, affect the state. And we have offices from Quincy, Florida, to Amakwe, and we cover the state with all uh, commercial um, blocks, groves, and um, propagating nurseries. That's our other responsibility to do that. So every, everything that's coming out of our budget bureau, make sure that those propagating nurseries have material that is true type and disease disease free so that when the grower plants it in the ground it has its best ability to move and grow healthily cleanly. Um, then we have plant inspection. Our plant inspection teams, that's really when Craig talked about how many trappers we have in the state. 
we share that responsibility with USDA APHIS, um, but our trappers are statewide. They're all they're trapping year round, um, making sure that everything is okay there. And then our plant inspection also handles all of our like garden centers and our nurseries that you see on the side of the road. And they're handling all of that and making sure that they're going into Walmart and Lowe's and Home Depot and everybody else, Dollar General, if they have a license, they're making sure that they are uh, certified to sell and making sure that there's no issues popping up there and putting hold orders where they need to. Um, and like I said, I am, they do our detector dogs and which run on the parcels. Um, and it's also where we use our gal saws. We have two gal saws in the phase four designed with Um They're currently using them as well on the curbs to help those detect uh, on property. Um, and they can detect detectors elsewhere on the ground um, and have a tendency to want to go underground when they're threatened. So, so once you we start to treat, that's what they like to do. Um, so what happens after you have a detection? What is, what is the process in the, from the field to, to the end of the game? Well, that's, you know, if we're doing it, if we get a call from a grower that says, hey, I see something, I don't know what it is. We'll send our team out to collect a sample, take a look at it. That sample is then overnighted to the lab in Gainesville. Our lab in Gainesville is very, 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 very good. They are probably the best lab on this side of the United States. Probably California is the only other lab, probably state lab that is as good as we are. And I would say we probably are. Um, they have experts in nematology, entomology, plant pathology, botany, um, and, and employ some of the most advanced diagnostic um, techniques. They develop protocols that other states and other countries use. When we get into fights with the EU, with this group, they compare what protocols we deploy with other countries. Um, so um, it is, it's, it's a very good, they have a, a very good team up there that is able to make a diagnostics decisions quickly. Once that determination with them is done, if it's something that it will be quarantinable, that we take another action, it will go to the USDA, will go on to the FDA, as you know, and uh, labs, of course, is on from the FDA. That is always the way it works. So once we call it one way to the other, if it's positive and it's a quarantinable thing, it's always going to go up there for confirmation to make sure that we have done our job right. While all of that is being done, um, our surveyors, our inspectors are in the field and they're delimiting. There is a set protocol for us on how we delimit and how we start. Um, which I'll, and I'll example with the sign out to the wind snail. Once you have the, the wind across it, it's a three millimeter horn followed by a half mile bubble. If you look at some of the things for citrus, we always are on a one mile arc. Everything we do starts in the one mile. Once we hit the one mile, we go five miles, 10 miles, 20 miles. That's how it is. So everything that we do has a set protocol of how we in turn deal with it, whether it's on the transect or within those arcs. Once all of that has been determined, um, a determination can be made that, you know, it may be that it goes up and they say, no, leave back Millie Bun. Oh my God, we got it in the groves. Well, we had it in the port of Troy. Um, it's not a issue, it's not a quarantinable issue at that point. Um, you know, so it may be something that we have a, had done a pest alert before because we've seen it in Florida. It has unlimited distribution, but maybe now it's moving and it's showed up someplace else. Um, it could end up being a regulated action. And the regulated action isn't a quarantine. It's a it's an idea like okay we're reg we are having an area where we're sending people in to take a look what are they going to have to do you know maybe there's treatment available but it's a regulated entry we're not necessarily quarantining the grower and trying to make sure that nobody gets sick um, and then of course you have the quarantine action um, everything that we do um, 
with a regulated incident or within the quarantine, usually it's driven by some kind of compliance agreement back and forth. Okay. Yeah, we got it. Okay. How are you going to move it? Okay. How are you going to treat it? Okay. Sometimes we can treat. Sometimes we let the grower treat. Um, if it's fruit fly, we're treating. We're the ones going out and we're doing, and this last fruit fly, we had a male. Great. We found a male. That starts the clock for us. We set, we set a core area for it. Okay. We start expediting and getting the trap. We get those traps put out and we have this, this 10 to 5 trapping activity that goes on. Now we get two flies. Okay. Now we got a now we got a we got a control action going on. Now we're starting our spray application. Oh my God, we only have a male and female. Now we're at the trip stage. Now we're in this control stage. Now we're sprinting. Now we got and it's all based on the life cycle of the horse. Is it wanting to spray the whole spread of flies? No, it's spraying the fruit fly, the peach fly, is it guava fly? What it, what is it that we're trying to get rid of? What time of year it is? What is the life cycle? It's all based on the life cycle. So it's like an oriental fruit fly right now. It's hot. Their life cycle is burning pretty quickly. You get in the winter time, it's going to burn pretty cold. It's going to take us longer to get to get done with it. Um, if you look at oriental fruit fly right now, we started May 14th. We have two more weeks. Um, we have one more application that we can do. And in May 14th, we'll do our last control action. And hopefully we'll get our trapping. We continue to feed those flies. We'll call it and we'll do it. We'll call eradication and drop the seed. May to August. Redland, fall, and spring. Just a different time frame because of the conditions that we were in. Um, and again, in Redlands, we had all kinds of compliance agreements and growers were treating and we were putting them under the compliance. We, allowed them to move if they weren't in the core, but if they were in the core, we couldn't move. Don't go into the core, don't ever drive through the core when you're using this thing. Because if you're the guy hauling guinea pigs to the core, it's going to stop you and you're going to be done. You can't keep your job. So it's those kinds of things. Go around. Don't, don't bring stuff out of the quarantine into the quarantine. Um, but anyway, so it's our really our determination with our science based on the most recent science, based on what we know and other factors that we will set what we do, whether it's quarantine regulated. It will also determine whether or not we are able to eradicate it um, and when we should release the state from the quarantine, whether it's statewide or geographical. So fruit fly detections, like I said, that's factor cirrus. Um, that's oriental fruit fly. That's the one we're dealing with right now. Um, it, like I said, trapping occurs year round. It is a joint effort again. Um, and they always will trigger our response. The fruit flies that do, med fly, oriental fruit fly, and peach fly, Mexican fruit fly, and guava fruit fly. We will always have a response to any of those. We do have a native carob fly um, population here in Florida, which is why we have protocol, which is why they trap to get them out there so that when fruit pickers them under protocol and treatment to make sure that their care fly, which is a native population to us, isn't a part of that block. So then what? You know, with the fly process, kind of talked about it. Um, it's a delimiting, the increasing of trapping, the number of traps, the length of time. Um, all of that is part of any fly process. It, is it one male? One male starts one thing. If it was the, the funny thing about fly trapping is that one male does one thing, one female does one thing, and one native female does one thing. And it can throw the whole loop of where you start and what action you end based on which fly we were just in the middle. And now we're trapping. Are we got this weirdness going out there that we don't know about? Or is it a female? Is she made it? Is she not? If she's made it and we determine that, we send that, believe it or not, a sample back to USDA and they're going to confirm, yep, she's made it. Yep, you're right. Okay. So all of that is based on what happens next with control for eradication. Um, the materials we use currently are flat, static, and a soil drenching material as well, NME. 
Um, again, like, like I said, we'll in control action, a lot of fruit stripping, fruit cutting to see if there's lava inside the fruit. What stage do we have? Um, a minimum quarantine for that is 81 square miles. The core area is one mile. Um, and then of course, like I said, compliance agreements, if there's ag in the area, the one right now is in St. Pete, saw houses. So there really isn't a need on the agricultural side. It didn't really impact them. Um, so what are the big takeaways? Not all detections require an action plan. We find it okay. It was here before, it was there somewhere else. Not all, not all detections require us to do something. Not all quarantines are the same. Can be state, can be geographical. Our state quarantine allow movement everywhere in the state. Not a lot of, not a lot of things have to happen at the state level. We can go all state. Internally, movement is very easy. Externally is where you get hung up. Whereas geographical impacts both how you move it in state and how you move it out of state. Um, not all quarantines are permanent. We put them down, we get them off, some take longer, still working on some, but we can remove quarantines based on the best known science and how we know. CBS is the one that we've had the longest currently for the 10 years. And it's really based on what we thought we had, which is both mating types to what we now know is only one, but we're still working through that. And not all quarantines prohibit the movement of agricultural products. Might tell you how you have to move them, but it won't permit, it won't prohibit you from moving unless you're inside the core, like I said, like the state problem. So when you find things, it's always scary. Hey, I got a call, I got a neighbor that wants to come do it. Do you do it? Do you pick it up? Do you stay still overnight? Do you have to do it? Do you have to do it? <laughs> but um, but those are things that as I never want a grower to feel like they can't tell us or call UNF. Even with GAUs, that person is the master gardener, that homeowner is the master gardener for this new event who came to us. And we do this with the process. We assign this application from the master gardener to the new grass in the house, and we are inspected at the new grass. So we are here, and we don't want anybody to feel like if I call. Don't want, um, and we don't want all of the avenues we have. So with that, I will. Great, thank you. Um, so our last presentation before lunch um, is from some of our USDA folks, UA folks in Valdosta. Um, Jonathan, I should have given you permission there. You should be able to share your screen, share your presentation. Can you hear us, Jonathan? There you go. You are unmuted now. So um, wanted to also make sure you guys, um, everyone's aware of different avenues they have um, for crop protection, um, as well as introduce you to uh, quarantine endorsement. Um, and you'll hear a little bit about the history of that in California as something that maybe we could somehow consider uh, for South Florida. So, Jonathan? Craig, Craig first, first of all, can you, can you hear, hear, me? hear me? Yep. Okay. Okay, good. good. I'm getting a getting little, little feedback. I can. Um, um, but again, my name is Jonathan Alley. I'm with the Orange Ranch in Kansas City. And today I'd like to provide you with uh, just a brief um, overview and history of the quarantine endorsement and then um, turn it over to the, um, to the other RMA. Um, uh, employees that are here and, and they can provide some additional information on the endorsement or some other information on crop insurance items that they may have. Um, first of all, let's begin by defining the definition of a quarantine. As defined by the uh, quarantine endorsement itself, it's an action taken by an appropriate authority. And that can either be local, state, or federal to control a specific pest that A, requires the destruction of your insured crop or plants on which your insured crop is growing, 
and you are not allowed to harvest and sell the insured crop prior to the destruction of the plants, or B, uh, does not permit the insured crop to be harvested, sold, transported, transferred, or otherwise restricts its movement from the location of where it was produced to the location of the buyer. Uh, there is an exception to this. It's uh, if the issuing authority allows movement of the crop after uh, meeting certain requirements or an inspection, then it doesn't qualify as a quarantine. So for instance, if a county declares a quarantine and, and let's say oranges are affected, but the county allows the producers to mitigate that damage by wa uh, performing a wash on those oranges to make them marketable, then by definition, the quarantine has uh, not occurred. The uh, quarantine endorsement uh, currently covers uh, citrus and avocados in California. It attaches to an APH plan of insurance, which is the actual production history plan of insurance. Buy-up insurance is required, which is um, insurance above the catastrophic level of protection. It covers losses when a quarantine has been declared. Uh, since its implementation, uh, participation has been consistent with approximately 40% of eligible buy-up policies having the endorsement attached and uh, no indemnities have been paid to date. Uh, this, uh, this slide is just a, a timeline of the um, product and its development uh, from its uh, implementation. Uh, from uh, on May of 2009, the uh, Federal Crop Insurance Board approved the quarantine endorsement beginning with the 2011 crop year and continuing it through the 2014 crop year. It was later extended to the uh, 2015 crop year. In June of 2014, uh, an appropriations committee required RMA to report to Congress on the costs and benefits and challenges of that of expansion for the endorsement. And in the same year and, and, and month, the uh, board approved the continuation of the endorsement as a pilot beyond 2015 without an uh, end date. Uh, in May of 2015, that report to Congress uh, was filed. The report to Congress uh, indicated uh, that the uh, quarantine endorsement provides additional coverage component. It may help stay growers' long-term economics and participation levels were uh, considered reasonable. It noted that uh, small growers purchased the product and then no indemnities had been paid yet to test if the uh, quarantine endorsement provides it, um, adequate coverage. And the authors of the uh, report uh, recommended continuing the uh, quarantine uh, endorsement as a pilot program. Uh, there was one specific uh, challenge that the report identified and that was that some insects and disease perils uh, may not create uh, an actually sound product. And in that report, they gave two examples. The first was um, citrus greening, which there's no cure. Uh, uh, there's no adequate control for the Asiatic uh, citrus cilia that spreads it. It's endemic in Florida, which would cause perpetual losses. And then the second example was the Asiatic citrus canker, in which there's no readily available control measures. Um, so with all that said, um, just to uh, let you know that uh, RMA does have authority for expansion, but it, um, the development of, other, uh, of that expansion needs to go through a, a process um, um, to be looked at and make sure the, uh, the uh, program is, is viable and uh, worthy of uh, implementation and also um, uh, affordable to producers. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to either Chandra, Davina, or David, uh, if they want to provide any additional information on the quarantine or other crop insurance items. Thank you. Do you guys have something to share with us, David? Um, I'll be happy to jump in. My name is David Duncan. I'm a risk management specialist for the, risk, the USDA Risk Management Agency in the Valdosta Regional Office. Uh, we're kind of the, the local, well, we are, we are the local contacts for you all um, in regards to any questions you might have uh, regarding the quarantine 
endorsement presentation you just heard. So if, if you do have any additional questions or you would have some more comments that you would like for us to consider, um, you can contact our office directly. And that is at the Valdosta Regional Office. Uh, and we'd be happy to supply uh, our contact information uh, for you all. Thank you, David. Any other final comments? Any questions for them? You can also write down their names and their email is just their first name dot last name at um, usda.rma.gov. Um, so I think it's um, one of the things that the reason that I thought it was important for them to share is talking with um, some of our, our state level organizations, the Florida Tomato Committee, the FFVA, they didn't know about this quarantine endorsement that is happening in California. And um, so therefore know that it's potentially a possibility for us. So if it's something that you think could be beneficial, um, probably on an organizational level, it might be um, best to go um, to your organizational level, whether it's the tomato committee, watermelon committee, whatever it may be, or FFEA, um, to talk about exploring this um, together as an industry-wide. Um, but thank you all for joining us um, today and for sharing your insights. Uh, so with that, we conclude our uh, meeting today. Appreciate you all in attendance.